everyone. It's great to see you all. We are over the halfway mark. Tonight we're starting the second half of the Old Testament module. And so um, we will be heading into the prophetic literature tonight. And uh, as is our custom, a short few words about um, some thoughts around the Word of God. And tonight it will come from one of the prophetic books, and that will be from Isaiah. It's a very familiar passage. I wish we had time to do far more or many more of the passages in the Old Testament prophetic books. In fact, all of the Old Testament books, but obviously my purpose is to introduce the books, the background, the setting, and give you a bit of a breakdown and summarize the message of each of the books, which is what we are going to do with the prophets as well. And then more specifically, part of my purpose is to provide the backdrop, the background for each of the prophetic books. We are given some information by almost every, every one of the prophetic books so that we can date them, we can plot them, and it's important to read them against that background as we will see a bit later on. Just by way of introduction tonight, I want to read from Isaiah chapter 6 and we know this particular story very well. Many of the prophets describe their calling uh, some of them were virtually minding their own business, and then God called them. Amos is such an example. He was purely a farmer, and God called him. We get the impression that several of the other prophets were perhaps of some kind of either royal or, or a priestly descent, and uh, yet the Lord called them to have a prophetic word, to utter a prophetic word to the nation. Um, Isaiah tells us about his calling in, in this chapter uh, that I'm reading portions of. And it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, and that's important little bit of information. It provides a bit of a historical backdrop. I can't tell you exactly why Isaiah waits till chapter 6 before he describes his calling. Uh, some scholars think that he may have had a prophetic ministry that some of the prophets uh, prophecies, th those that we find in chapters 1 to 5, may actually have come from him before this specific event when he felt a, a dramatic calling uh, to come into the prophetic ministry uh, or to have a specific kind of focus in his prophetic ministry. But Uzziah died. Um, he was crowned king um, in just about 805, 809 uh, and he reigned for about 52 years. So if you calculate backwards, it takes us to the middle of the 8th century, around about 750, 755 maybe, or 57, uh, is when Uzziah died. And so Isaiah is providing us with that little bit of a background. So in that same year that he died, probably creating many questions in the mind of someone like Isaiah, because Uzziah was a very successful king. And it raises issues about what will happen next uh, in the mind of Isaiah, probably in the mind of the nation. And that is against, and if I can take your minds back to our historical study, it take, takes you back to the pinnacle of the Assyrian Empire. They were, they were riding the crest of the wave. Uh, roughly 30 years after this event, they came and destroyed the northern kingdom by taking Samaria. And so that again is the bigger historical and geographical picture, political picture, that we have to bear in mind as you read this particular chapter. It's one of the reasons why I say the historical background to the prophets, to the prophetic literature is so important. Otherwise you read and read and read, you're not always sure exactly why a prophet said whatever they have said. And so the historical background helps a huge amount for us to actually plot them on a, on a timeline, but also to understand something of the geographical, something of the political challenges that they face, and then to understand some of the spiritual message that they uh, presented to the nation at the time. So in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. The train of His robe filled the temple. We, we get the impression that Isaiah is in the temple, obviously, either by vision or he is in the temple and he then sees a vision. And if that is the case, it may just be that Isaiah was a priest as he was serving uh, in the temple at the time. 
above him, above God, uh, were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a, a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Send me. He said to me, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the hearts of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And when you look at that particular calling and the message that God has given Isaiah, obviously summarizing to some extent uh, when you read the rest of the book, uh, much more unfolds. But Isaiah was given a very, very difficult task, and that is to go to a people who would not listen. And he is told up front that even when you speak to them, they will not listen. Their hearts will be callous, their ears will be shut, they won't see. And if that is the message that you give to anybody, in fact, if you were offered a job, and they say, we want to give you this job, but we tell you up front you're not going to be successful. Uh, so don't even try. Don't, you, you're not going to have any fulfillment in your job. I think many of us will probably back off and say, I'd rather find, I'd rather find a job somewhere where at least I have some fulfillment and some success uh, and I, I can feel I can add some value and I'm of some kind of worth. Isaiah was told up front that his ministry was, in a certain sense, not going to be successful, not in the terms that we think about success today, and that is masses of people coming to know the Lord and bowing, and, uh, there's a big revival and so on. And there's only one way that one can respond to a message like that, and that is by seeing God. Which is why Isaiah needed to see God. Isaiah did not go, he did not respond to his preaching, his prophetic ministry, because he saw crowds of people coming to know the Lord. I know many a minister, colleagues of mine, even when I was studying, and they had big dreams. There's nothing wrong with big dreams, nothing wrong about a vision. But some of them, I think, had a picture in their minds of preaching to stadiums full of people like a Billy Graham. And one's got to ask yourself the question, what is my motive? Why do I want to go out and share the gospel with other people or preach or be in the ministry or whatever it is that the Lord may call us to do? Why, why am I doing this? And if your motive is self-fulfillment, if it is money, well, back off right now because the ministry is not full of money, uh, unless you invite people uh, to pay for your ministry and, and send some money over the mail uh, and so forth. But unless your focus is God, unless you have had a picture of God, a vision of God, I think we will be extremely frustrated because we may try, we may go, we may work, uh, we may do everything, but it will be in our own power and it will be for the wrong motive. Isaiah needed to see God. And when he saw God, when he had a vision of God, God could have told him anything because he was responding to God. He was responding to a vision of God. And I, I honestly believe that that vision was his motive and his motivation and his drive in ministry. So he wasn't looking for the immediate physical result. He was looking for whether this is what God wants me to do. And that kept him going. And when I speak to people who are in ministry especially, I say to them in, in full-time uh, pastoral or uh, missions ministry or whatever, I, I say to them, your calling to ministry, your calling to the ministry is what is going to keep you going. Because the going is going to get tough somewhere along the line. The truth is that very few people are the Billy Grahams of this world. 
95, 95% plus of people in some kind of ministry never see the, that sort of result. They never build the big churches. The big churches only make it into the news because they have a story to tell, but the story is only representative of 5% of what is happening in the world out there. Most churches in this world, most per churches on earth in every country are actually small or average of size. They're not big. And, and very few people have a ministry like the Billy Grahams of this world. Very few people, percentage-wise. And therefore, unless our motive is God, unless we've seen God, unless we have had a vision of God, uh, it will be very difficult to live and minister out there. That applies to all of what we do in terms of living our lives here on earth. If we don't do it for God, somehow or the other uh, have our vision on God and not on ourselves, it will be very difficult to be successful as a Christian and to live the life of a Christian. And so that's my sermon. I, I, need, to, I need to stop there because I can very easily get into sermon mode. Um, but let's, um, let's pray together and then we get into uh, the lecture material for tonight. Father, we thank you for the way that you have called Isaiah and for what we can learn from his experience. And I pray that as we study more tonight, as we learn more about the prophetic literature and the books that you have included in your word for us, that you would grow us in our faith, that you would give us a vision of yourself, Lord. This is ultimately our goal as we dig into the word, as we learn more about the Bible and the books in the Bible and the message that you have left us. Lord, ultimately our purpose is to get to know you. And I pray that you would encourage us tonight, that you would stimulate us, that you would teach us uh, to know more about you, that you would show us yourself and that you and your holiness and your greatness and your power will become our motive to live for you every single day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have now concluded the study of the historical material in the Old Testament. Uh, there are little bits and pieces added. Uh, Isaiah has some chapters about historical information. And there is some material that we find in Jeremiah. Uh, several of the other books will add, will add bits and pieces here and there. But essentially we have covered all of the historical section of the Old Testament. And then we had ha we've had a, a peak view into the wisdom literature. Uh, again, I, I wish we had time to sit still and spend more time in a book like the Psalms and just work our way slowly through the Psalms or the Proverbs or even the Song of Songs, which we concluded with very briefly at our last lecture. wish we had more time to dig deeper into those books. Uh, but, but my purpose is to remind you once again is simply to introduce that to you, provide the backdrop, and so that by the end of this module you have had a, a peek view into every single one of the books. And uh, at the end of the lecture notes, I suggest some reading material out of every one of the books that we deal with. I want to encourage you once again uh, for your own benefit to actually read some of those chapters or to read those chapters or sections that I recommend just to get a feel for every one of the books and that you set yourself a task somewhere in the future to actually read through the whole of the Old Testament and that you use your notes, read the introductory section and then read that particular book uh, which will then, I honestly believe, open up that book to you uh, a lot better than uh, you would uh, be able to read it without the knowledge that you pick up here. The history of Israel and uh, particularly the period of uh, the monarchy after the split of the kingdom uh, provides us with the backdrop to what we are going to do from this point forward because we will be moving backwards and forwards on that historical timeline. Uh, I've given you a little bit of a taste for Isaiah, looking at Isaiah chapter 6. He provides us with a bit of information about that. Some of the other books don't uh, give us very specific information necessarily, although most of them open with some historical data or background information which helps us to plot them. And a few of them are completely undated. Joel is one of them. We don't know exactly when Joel lived. Uh, there's no historical information about that particular book. Malachi is later, but again, the, the actual date, the exact date is not provided in the book of Malachi. But several of the other prophets provides us, provide us with enough information so that we can actually plot them uh, on a timeline. 
And so tonight we'll be looking at an introduction to prophetic literature, what it is and how it operated, a brief introduction to that. Uh, every one of the topics and every one of the books that we deal with um, have loads and loads written about them. So I can only encourage you to do some additional reading uh, about the things that we talk about. And then I'm going to introduce you to three of the four major prophets tonight, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And stuck between Jeremiah and Ezekiel is the book of Lamentations, which is a wisdom book. And um, I'm following this, the order in the Bible. Uh, but as a wisdom book, we should have dealt with it last week uh, as part of the wisdom literature. But because it follows um, on, uh, uh, after I, uh, Jeremiah, uh, I'm just following that particular sequence. And then next week we'll do uh, the fourth of the four major prophets and then get into the minor prophets and the remainder of our time together. Uh, your reading, you're, you're encouraged again to read wider. Uh, if any topic or any one of the books here uh, grabs you in terms of your, your curiosity, please go and read up more. Uh, the prescribed material will give different kind of information to what I am able to cover over here, maybe coming from a different angle, uh, but please continue to read wider than what we are able to do here. So when we look at prophecy uh, in Israel, uh, going back to, uh, into the history of Israel, we are not given every bit of information as to when it started, how it started, and where and exactly how it operated. It is absolutely uh, almost just taken for granted, and that is that prophecy happens. Um, and so, slowly but surely, it appears on the scene, uh, but uh, prophecy is first mentioned in the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 to 17, uh, and it's an interesting reference. Uh, in fact, maybe we should just uh, go there quickly, just in case you don't have time to do that. So let's do that tonight uh, and, and read together from uh, Numbers 11. Uh, and it's, it's one of the first places where we find a reference to the prophets. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me seventy of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Make them come to the tent of meeting, that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there. I will take off the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves and, and so on in verse 18 and further, and then down to verse 24. That's the back, background. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of the elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud, in the cloud, and spoke with them. And he took the spirit that was on him, and put the spirit on the seventy elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not, so, they did not do so again. A little bit of an uncertainty about the translation uh, of that, uh, and it can also be they, they prophesied and continued to do so. So you can actually take it either way. Either they didn't prophesy again or the Hebrew is not clear. Uh, they, they continued to prophesy. So that's one of the first references in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, prophecy in Israel developed into, um, in stages. Uh, we have reference to Moses as a prophet, um, which is fairly obvious, and when we get to the definition of prophecy a bit later on, you will see why that is. But then, obviously, there are some of the judges who are also called prophets. Um, a prophetess is Deborah in the judges, and then Samuel, a little bit later on in the book of Samuel, is also called a prophet. And so those are pre-monarchy days, pre-the kingdom. And then, during the kingdom, we find reference in uh, kings and chronicles to some prophets, such as Nathan, who seemed to have had a relationship with David. He was able to come into the court of the king and talk to him around the issue of the sin with Bathsheba, for example. And the Lord sent him to David to go and talk to him. And David was very receptive to uh, this particular man speaking to him. Again, we're not given the background. We, we don't know where this thing comes from. It's simply assumed that whoever was reading kings in those days would have known about prophets. And so we find Elijah and Elisha also mentioned. And they were very unique in the sense that they also performed many miracles. Not many of the prophets later on uh, 
performed miracles as far as we know. But uh, we see some of that happening through Elijah and Elisha. And then we really come to what we, uh, what we will be focusing on in the next uh, number of lectures, and that is the classical prophets. We call them the writing prophets because they have left uh, either from their own pen or someone else has written about them, but they have left us some uh, written record of what they said and some of the actions that they took and how they behaved. There may have been a slow development of this concept of an, an office, that you may call a prophet, such as that of a priest and a king. And along with those, you may have had a prophet as well. Uh, we're not 100% sure, as I said, how all of that developed, but there really seems to be something like that uh, developing. Now, prophecy, against the background of um, a relief of Baal, prophecy was not an unknown concept in the whole of the ancient uh, Near East. Uh, in fact, we find many references to prophets in extra biblical literature. Sometimes they seem, there seems to be uh, a combination of prophet priest, as is the case with Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we read how Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal, and there were hundreds of prophets of Baal. And they called prophets, but at the same time, both Elijah and these prophets are uh, erecting an altar and offering sacrifices to their respective gods. And so they, it's a little bit of a confusion. Are they prophets or are they priests? Uh, are they sacrificing or are they prophesying? And there seems to be a combination of the two from time to time. In other cases, I've already referred to the case of Amos. Uh, he was a farmer. He was definitely not a priest. And he was minding his own business and God called him to go and uh, speak to or preach to the northern kingdom. And uh, the king is often the recipient, obviously, as a representative of the nation. And so the prophets speak to the king. Elijah and Elisha did that on an ongoing basis with Ahab and some of the other kings that, that ruled during their time. Nathan spoke to the king because the king represented the nation. If you wanted to address the nation, you don't necessarily go from town to town to preach a message. You go to the authority and then... Through the authority, your hope is that the message will uh, be taken to the rest of the nation. They often receive their visions, their dreams, their messages via a vision. A vision is slightly different from a dream. A dream is when you sleep, and we all know what dreams are, and something very real occurs in your mind uh, somehow or the other. A vision may be when you are actually awake or in some kind of a semi-trance-like state. And you see pictures which is like a dream, but you're not necessarily sleeping. And then, of course, there, uh, we get the impression that there are also trance-like experiences, such as the, the passage I just read, where the Spirit simply comes upon some of these people and they start uttering words which they seem to have uh, not, not necessarily out of control, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, words that are given to them or some actions given to them that are clearly from God, not something that they dreamed up or thought up uh, or whatever. Some of the early prophets, um, I've already referred to Elijah um, and Elisha, but during earlier biblical times, such as during the days of Moses, um, and we've had that one reference, Deuteronomy 18 is another reference to that, and then Samuel is called a prophet as well, and there seems to be a mixing of those offices, sometimes a leader or a judge, uh, can also be a priest and a, and a prophet. Uh, by the time of the monarchy, there seems to be a settling of, of the office of a prophet. And there may have been an official prophet like the Nathans who came into the court of the king and he was the trusted one. He would also be regarded as a wise person. He would be consulted uh, in the case of a big decision that needed to be made. Um, but then some others were simply... Um, they were simply living their lives or, uh, as I said before, minding their own business and somehow God spoke to them or the Spirit came upon them and they started prophesying uh, or they had a prophetic type ministry. And we'll talk about the definition in a moment. Uh, Saul, when he was anointed by Samuel, left Samuel initially and, and he, he then fell among a school of prophets, uh, which is a phenomenon that you find in the Old Testament. Uh, this seems to be where uh, prophets were actually trained or people came and they had a calling and they came uh, 
like they would go to university or college today uh, to be trained to become a prophet. In other words, how to hear the voice of God and how to have a ministry of speaking to the nation. And Saul fell among, uh, among a group like that and the Spirit came upon him and he started uttering some words as well uh, of prophecy in that particular context. We're never told exactly what it is that he said. Uh, as we have seen also in Numbers 11, we're not told exactly what they said, but it was certainly a phenomenon that was recognizable by the people around and those who wrote it up for us. When we go back to that particular passage of Saul being uh, anointed as king and who then came among some prophets, and when you combine it with a few other bits of information that we find in the Old, Old Testament, some of the characteristics include that uh, there were sometimes a group of prophets. Oftentimes, as is the case for most of the writing prophets, we don't get the impression that they represent a school of prophecy, but rather they were individuals. But back in the earlier days, it seems like there were these groupings, such as Elisha. Um, on a previous occasion in the first module, we talked about an incident where Elisha was invited by the prophets, they seemed to be trainees of Elisha. And they needed to go down and chop some wood, uh, cut some wood so that they can build a building. And um, again, we get the impression that there was a community of prophets uh, in, that, in several of the stories around both Elijah uh, and Elisha. And they were associated with high places oftentimes. Um, and that is the case with the prophets of Baal, uh, on Mount Carmel, for example. And so other religions at the time also had prophets. But as I said, there seems to be a bit of a, a mix between prophet and priest from time to time. And then sometimes prophets showed frenzied or ecstatic behavior. Um, we, we're not told exactly what the content is of what they said, but they seem to utter words in some kind of a frenzy uh, or ecstatic uh, state. They could be consulted for guidance. When Saul went to look for the donkeys after they got lost, his servant suggested that they go to the town where he knew that there was a seer, uh, a prophet, and that happened to be Samuel. And uh, Saul said, well, what shall we give him? And they, they scratched around and eventually uh, they agreed on some kind, some kind of a, a payment that they will give to Samuel so that Samuel can then prophesy for them because he was regarded as someone who could see further or deeper uh, or more than the normal person. And as I said before, they also lived communally um, in groupings, it seems like. The, that situation seems to have changed over time. The, the storyline of prophecy is not told in the Bible. Uh, the, the story of the Bible, the story of Israel is told, and it's assumed that the readers understood what prophecy was all about. But when you get to the later or the so-called classical prophets, the prophetic books found in our Old Testament canon from Isaiah to Malachi uh, represents, uh, represent these later uh, prophets as we call them, not the earlier ones uh, which I have just mentioned. But they operated from around the 8th century to about the end of the, uh, the 5th century. That's roughly where we can plot uh, Malachi as we will see later on. The nation, uh, in fact, the two nations, the northern nation and the southern nation, the northern kingdom and the southern uh, kingdom, always needed spiritual direction. And so these prophets provided the words of God or the word of God that they needed. Uh, of course, they had the law of Moses, the Torah. That was always available. And slowly but surely, other books were added over time, including the prophetic literature. But every time there was a challenge, there needed to be some kind of an interpretation of what this means and how this applies to the current situation. And more often than not, the historical background or the political, the world political situation provided the backdrop. There's the threat from the Assyrians. And Isaiah steps to the fore and he provides some guidance while the Assyrians are a threat. Now, the northern kingdom, and Isaiah was speaking to the southern kingdom. We'll get to that point in a moment. But the northern kingdom, the king consulted and called in the help of other nations. Isaiah said to the king, don't rely on other nations, rely on God. So Isaiah was used by God to help them to focus on God. 
Hence the calling of Isaiah, which became such an important event in his own life. He knew what it meant to have a vision of God and with the vision of God to provide the king with some guidance in terms of the future. The later prophet's messages uh, became very pertinent when it was evident that God's judgment might and even would be fulfilled. And there was far more of an urgency then to actually write it up. Um, and, and I guess over time, more and more people gained the ability as writing uh, became more uh, known and common in those days. And, and some of the prophets and many of the prophets then started writing it down in order to leave it as a legacy for future generations. We have one such a reference, and we'll look at that uh, later on, but one reference from the book of Jeremiah uh, to the book of Daniel, when Daniel actually tells us that he read in the book of Jeremiah, in the prophecies of Jeremiah, that the Lord said that the exile was going to last for 70 years. And as he did a calculation, he said he was praying and, and uh, appealing to God to actually let the exile come to an end. Now, I'm, I'm relating that because we already get the impression that Daniel was reading Jeremiah or the stuff that came from Jeremiah, which is quite interesting. So it was ri written up even during the time of Jeremiah already. And we'll look at that a little bit later on. In terms of the nature of Old Testament prophecy, when we hear the word prophecy, we normally see uh, some kind of a, a person like not too long ago when someone suggested the 21st of May 2011 is going to be the final. We normally associate prophecy with projecting into the future. In other words, foretelling. Now, when you go to the bulk of Old Testament prophecy, it is actually not what it is. Uh, in fact, the exact same thing in the New Testament as well. In most of the cases, we're talking about foretelling, where the prophet hears from God and speaks into an existing current situation. Rather than telling people what's going to happen 2,000 years down the road, he is telling people what God wants them to do in their immediate situation. And that you can, you can read through the, the, the prophets, and you will find that by and large, the prophecies are about a current contextual situation back then when the prophet lived, which is why we have to study the background of the prophet so that we can gain something about some knowledge of the historical situation of that prophet. Now, there, there is obviously some elements of foretelling, uh, predicting, uh, some future element, and, and we'll see some of that even tonight. And the next week there, there will be more of that. Uh, but prophets and prophecy played an important role in the life of Israel during the Old Testament era in that they uh, provide us with a substantial part of our Old Testament. Uh, we have the four major prophets and then another 12, so 16 prophetic books out of the 39. Um, and, and the major role of the prophets... Uh, was to go back into the Torah, into the law of God, into those first books of Moses, to read them, to study them, to hear God's voice somehow in the word as well as in whatever way God revealed himself to them, and then to interpret the immediate circumstances around the time that they lived, and then to give guidance as to how people should behave in those days. Uh, that is the essence of Old Testament prophecy. We also often refer to, to their messages as oracles, which is a word that refers to wise or prophetic utterances. And uh, some of them were straight down the line condemnation, and saying the Lord spoke, he's going to condemn you. Now, of course, when God says that, there is a present as well as a future element in that, because when you talk about, the, and we'll pick that up later on, when, when some of the prophets talk about the day of the Lord, there's an obvious reference to a day that is still to come. But there are occasions when the prophets interpret the day of the Lord as having arrived because the judgment of God is already on them. And you can only imagine how some of the prophets and the people responded when they lived through, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the fall of Jerusalem. They have never, ever thought that that is ever possible. In fact, the nation ever thought that that is possible. And constantly God warned them. God sent them prophets to warn them. 
that we also see from a New Testament perspective. And they didn't listen, and eventually God's judgment, judgment actually fell upon them. And that's the way the prophets interpreted that. They said, this is what God has told us, and this is exactly what has happened. And so most of the literature we find in the Old Testament is relevant to the time that they lived. And then there are projections into the future, either to uh, almost immediately into the future in their own lifetime or generation. And then in some of the prophetic literature we find uh, generations forward and there are references, obvious references from a New Testament perspective that we can go back and say, well, these things have been referring to or they refer to Jesus Christ and His coming. And so, yes, from that angle, there is prophecy into the future, which is then foretelling rather than only foretelling. And when we get to um, Old Testament prophecy and fulfillment of prophecy, there is one thing that I'm going to refer to again and again and again, and that is we find the immediate circumstances of a prophet. And oftentimes there is a fulfillment immediately in his or her own generation or time. But then as you continue to go on, oftentimes there is a, a, a future um, a reference, or there's a reference to, to Jesus Christ, which then in a certain sense, not in a certain sense, which then will be a reference to the future. And then, of course, there is another possibility, and that is in the prophets that you now have a reference to the second coming of Jesus as well. Uh, second coming. So, what we find oftentimes in prophecy is, uh, and this is one of the questions we should be asking, is, is, this, is there an immediate fulfillment and is done and over with? Or is there an intermediate fulfillment? For us, as we look back, it will be New Testament fulfillment in the coming of Jesus. Or is there a reference here to, even for us, a future fulfillment? And that is something related to the second coming. And, and my personal contention is that if you ignore these two at the front and only read the prophets to find out when Jesus is going to come back, I personally think it is a waste of time, as we have just seen recently um, with one day that has come and gone being prophesied or predicted as the end. And I can tell you now that 21st of October 2011 is also going to come and go, um, and God will not worry about those dates because He is not concerned about what any person on, in, on earth is saying about the day He's coming. He knows the day, and it may be before, it may be on the day, it may be beyond that day because the Bible is very clear that we don't know the day. And so the first question when we read prophetic literature in the Old Testament is the first one, and that is, what is the immediate fulfillment in the time of the prophet? Then secondly, we ask the question, how does this fulfill in the coming of Jesus? And only then can we ask the question, is there perhaps an element that will help us as we prepare for the second coming. Not to try and work out the dates and the precise sequence of events as they will unfold during that time, but primarily to help us to prepare for the second coming. God has never told us that we can work out the details of how the second coming will take place, when it will take place, the exact timing, the hours, the days, and everything else. But God has told us to be ready and to be prepared and, and everything in the prophetic literature, and in fact anything and everything in the Bible is about that, and that is to help us to be prepared whether Jesus comes today, tomorrow, or over 2,000 years, and that is to prepare uh, for His coming. So in order to correctly interpret the books of the prophets, we have to understand the background. We also need to understand the prophets against what we call progressive revelation, and that is God has not told Moses everything. God has not told Abraham everything. Abraham lived as a person of his time. He therefore had many wives, or more than one wife, and so did Solomon and David. When you get to the New Testament era, it's very clear Jesus' interpretation is that we should only have one wife or one husband. Uh, and so we can't go back uh, to that time. Now, the question in my mind, I'm sure in yours, is why did God allow David and Abraham and others to have more than one wife? I can't give you the answer to that. One of the answers probably is that God allowed it because it seems to be 
the going thing in those days. And it was a way in which uh, oftentimes women, and especially those who were without care, that they were taken care of. That there were no pension funds and that sort of thing. So maybe God allowed it for that reason. I, I can't give you the answer to that. However, we know that as time progressed, God revealed more and more and more of Himself to the point where that middle circle pr pr uh, provides us with the full revelation of God. And what we have in the Scriptures in the Bible represents the full revelation of God. This is what God wants us to know in terms of our salvation, knowing Him, serving Him, worshipping Him, and being ready for His second coming, for Jesus' second coming. We have that in the Bible. But we have the privilege of looking back and then seeing how God revealed more and more and more about Himself over time in the Old Testament. We also therefore need to understand the prophets as people of their time living before Jesus Christ. They had prophetic um, utterances about the time when the Messiah will come, but they didn't know exactly every single little detail about that. When you, when you piece it all together in retrospect, then there are amazing bits of information in the Old Testament about, about Jesus, uh, wonderful information about Jesus. But you wouldn't have been able during the time of Isaiah to say on that particular date there will be a baby born in Bethlehem. Um, he will grow up in Nazareth. His father and mother's names will be Joseph and Mary. Those finer details would not have been available to them because God revealed more and more about himself. The Old Testament prophet is mostly described and pictured as, as a mouthpiece of God. And that, in a certain sense, is the way we've got to understand New Testament prophecy as well. It is God speaking to His people. And God does not, God does not speak through me for two generations further down the line. There may be an element of that, but when God is speaking to His people, He, want, he wants His people to know what He's saying for them. He doesn't necessarily speak to them about the future. There may be an element of that, and we have a, an example in the New Testament where a prophet by the name of Agabus came to, uh, to Antioch in Syria, uh, and he predicted, he prophesied, predicted that there will be a famine and that people need to be ready for that. But that happened in their own generation. It wasn't for five generations down the road or for 2,000 years later. It was primarily to help them to be ready to hear the Word of God. The message in the prophets, you will find more often than not, is about their spiritual condition. It is about Israel not serving God, and therefore God calling them back to Himself, using imagery, using words, using the law, and, and using sometimes actions by the prophets. And the, the main purpose of all of that was to bring them back into a relationship with Himself. There are times when God needed to simply encourage them. Uh, when Isaiah came to uh, Hezekiah, he wanted to encourage him. He said, get yourself ready because you're going to die soon. But you were a good man uh, and you served God. So it was an encouragement. And God gave him that insight that he was, he was going to die and he needed to get ready for that. Uh, the story goes that Hezekiah pleaded with God and God extended his life by 15 years or so. But again, there was a, a, a good relationship between Hezekiah and Isaiah in that particular case. The name or the title of the prophet in Hebrew is most often the word Navi uh, or Nabi, uh, which is uh, the Hebrew for a called one. But he was also referred to as a seer, which is uh, the word see. To see deeper things is behind the word seer. Someone who can see or receive a divine message. And uh, the, the ministry of prophets in the Old Testament is normally associated with some kind of a crisis. Either the Assyrians are attacking or the nation is not serving God like in Elijah and Elisha's case. Uh, e Elijah even complained to God. He said, Lord, I'm the only one. Uh, in his impression, the whole of Israel served Baal. There was not one single other person who served God. God had to remind him that behind the scenes there were uh, some other people, uh, several hundreds of them, who also served God. But that is how bad the situation became. 
and God used an Elijah and Elisha. And then later on, the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs in, in the Old Testament to speak to the nation to bring them back or to help them prepare for a particular crisis that may come. All that was happening, such as the attacks from the Assyrians and later on the Babylonians uh, and so forth. The prophets and kings, um, I think I've said enough about this, but we find that there were regular occasions when a king had a particular relationship with a prophet. And sometimes there were more than one prophet who uh, spoke into the life of a particular king. And we'll see as we continue our journey through the prophets, we'll see that on a couple of occasions we have contemporaries, uh, prophets who spoke and lived and ministered during a similar time. But the official appointment and the functioning of the prophet as a guide to the king and a mouthpiece of God to the throne is unclear. We don't know how that happened, uh, what the conditions were, and, and, and we know why it happened. And that is probably when a king wanted to serve God, uh, he obviously needed a prophet to help him understand what God uh, was saying. The classical prophets, um, we refer to uh, the classical prophets... Uh, as those in the later period, especially the writing prophets. And then there are some common traits that we find in the books that we will be looking at later on. Uh, they address some messages to the covenant people of God. It's uh, Israel, Judah, sometimes both of those are included or references, cross-references are made. Uh, speaking to the king in Judah, the prophet may refer to Samaria, to the northern kingdom, and, um, and quote something that is happening over there. And sometimes messages are given to both Ju Judah and, um, and Israel. And there are the odd occasion, two or three of the prophets, where uh, they directly either address another nation or they speak about another nation. One, one example is the city of Nineveh, and, one, and another example is that of the, the nation of Edom. And they are, they are the direct objects of a particular prophetic book. Um, but then many of the prophets include prophecies about the nations that, that live in, uh, in neighboring countries around Israel or Judah. They also interpret the social, socio-political events of the time, such as the foreign powers uh, around them. They use the div divine formula. Uh, thus says the Lord, or this is the Lord's vo word to you, or the word of the Lord came to uh, Isaiah the prophet, and so on. So those concepts, uh, meaning that they spoke with authority. It's not their own uh, words. It's not a little sermon they prepared. It's not something they think. They, they honestly believe that they were speaking on behalf of God. Looking back, that is exactly what they have done. They have spoken on behalf of God. They encourage the people to go beyond the rituals, um, because this has always been the challenge. It was the challenge that Jesus faced when he was on earth. Uh, the people, the Pharisees and the scribes at the time, the priests and so on, they were going through the rituals. They were going through the, the letter of the law, but they didn't understand the relationship with God. And, and the prophets often used the Old Testament or the law or the Torah to bring people back and say, it's, it's, not about, it's not about the sacrifices. Isaiah, typical example, Isaiah 58 is about fasting. And he says, you're going through the ritual of fasting, but it's meaningless. And God is speaking through Isaiah. But true fasting is serving me, is loving me, and serving the poor. That's what a true fast really should look like. Now, you're withholding from food, but, but actually you don't understand it's not just withholding from food. It is, it is a heart in the right place that is important. And so it is the reinterpretation of the law and the covenant relationship with God. Uh, and we have several references in the Old Testament to the fact that ultimately God will renew the covenant. Because the covenant has drifted from Israel's point of view, from the nation's point of view, has drifted into a cold, I will do this and God will therefore bless me. And um, the prophets again and again say, that's not what it is. In fact, your hearts are hardened. It's like stone. And that's an image we, we get in Ezekiel. And the time will come when God will cut out the heart of stone and he will praise it with a heart of flesh. Uh, referring to the future when God will be in a, an intimate relationship uh, with, with them and something we believe that was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. You do not have a print of this particular slide because it's a picture uh, but it um, refers to, it's one that I found uh, on uh, archaeologicalstudybible.com. Um, and uh, 
Just very briefly, when you look at this, we have the Assyrian Age, uh, which goes back to the 8th uh, century. And uh, we have Amos and Hosea preaching to Israel. And those are the two prophets that, are, that focused primarily on Israel. And during that same stage or, or time, we have Isaiah and Micah. Uh, Micah only follows much later in our, in our canon, in our biblical canon. Uh, but he's a contemporary of Isaiah when you look at the, the dates uh, over there. And then there's Jonah during the same time. Uh, Jonah who went to the city of Nineveh. Jonah, uh, we, we know from uh, the references in the historical books as one single little line. But he also, because he went to Nineveh, we know that he preached before the fall of Nineveh, which happened in 612. So it must have happened somewhere before that particular time. Uh, he himself does not give a date. And then we enter the Babylonian age. And during this time, Israel has now gone. They're off the scene. Israel has been destroyed. So the rest of the prophets over here, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, they prophesied during the Babylonian time, all the way into the fall of Jerusalem. And then beyond, um, beyond that, and there's also Nahum, and Nahum uh, preaches about Nineveh. And then we have, during the Persian age, and that's after the Cyrus the king took over, we have a couple of prophets, and that's Haggai, Zechariah, uh, and they are associated with Ezra and Nehemiah, or slightly before their time, and the rebuilding of the temple. Actually, it's before their time, but the rebuilding of the temple, um, and, and that's when they, they lived and ministered in Judah while the temple was re rebuilt. Joel, uh, you can see from this particular um, date, it can range anywhere from 800 to 500. So it's actually very difficult to date Joel. Uh, he doesn't give any date, so it's very, very, um, it's almost impossible. And then Malachi. Uh, Malachi could be anywhere from 500 to 400 BC. Again, he doesn't give us a date, but we have indications that the temple has been rebuilt and functioning properly, uh, well, properly as in its functioning. Um, and so that's why we put him there. And then Obadiah is the one who preaches about Edom, and he reflects on the fall of Jerusalem. And that's why we can, we can uh, plot him fairly specifically. I will put this slide up again and again as we go through uh, the next number of weeks. Uh, just to remind us of the time frame of the prophets. Because you can see that it doesn't follow the canon or the outline that we have or the sequence that we have in our Old Testament. Now, before we get to the writing prophets, uh, we're going to take a break and, and uh, have some tea, and then we'll be back in here in 10 minutes' time, and then we'll go through uh, those prophets together. Uh, when we look at the writing prophets, uh, we have to distinguish between writing and non-writing prophets, uh, bearing in mind that the writing prophets do not represent all of the prophetic activity in the Old Testament. There have been many prophets functioning in the life of um, Israel or Judah um, that have not been either recorded. Some of their names are there, but we don't know anything about their activity. Uh, when it comes to the writing prophets in the Bible, um, they uh, are included at the end, um, but you have to shift them back into the historical section of the Old Testament, and um, they don't provide everything that they have said uh, to us. And we have prophets like Elisha and Elijah. We have some of their activities described in the historical section, such as kings, but they don't have any writing in terms of the messages that they preached at the time. That is actually in terms of the non-writing prophets, the most extensive uh, description of any of the prophetic activity that we have. Apart from that, we are uh, stuck with the writing prophets. The prophetic books are divided into two sections, major prophets and minor prophets. The major prophets are the four that we'll look at three tonight, but Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And they are called major not because they were more important, but because they are longer. And they are written on scrolls, each one by themselves. But when you get to the, the minor prophets, they are written on one single scroll. And in the Jewish canon, they simply refer to them as the twelve. And you can imagine how difficult it must have been at the time to actually find your, your place. You want to read a, a couple of verses or, well, they didn't have verses, but you want to read something from Zechariah or from Obadiah. You would have to go through the whole scroll to try and find your place, which 
obviously then makes a lot more sense to write them all into single books. Now that brings us to the first of our uh, study, our, our prophetic studies tonight, and that is Isaiah, uh, who was guiding the nation during the time of the Assyrian threat, uh, looking forward to the release from the exile. And um, when we look at the prophets, what we need to do in most of the prophets, not all of them provide us with this kind of information, but typically, and Isaiah is a good example, typically the first verse of the first chapter would provide you with the historical setting. And uh, this is what it says, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And that is very, very important because we now know that Isaiah preached, although he lived prior to the fall of, of Samaria, but he didn't focus on Samaria, he focused on Jerusalem and on Judah, the southern kingdom. And he was the son of Amos, spelled with a Z over here, meaning that it's not related to Amos the prophet. It's someone else whom we don't know. Uh, but the, these are the vision or the vision that he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And then he jumps straight in and the very next verse in our NIV type translation is written in poetic style. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his master, the donkey, uh, the donkey his, uh, his owner's ma manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And that is something of the trend that you find in the prophet uh, Isaiah. Um, and so his time would range from about 740 to about 700 BC. That means that he and the nation around him obviously lived through the fall of Samaria in 722. When it comes to the book, the focus of, of Isaiah chapters 1 to 39 is on the monarchy under Hezekiah and, and other kings around him, as we have just seen. Uh, we saw that he was called in the year King Uzziah died. The fact that Uzziah is mentioned in, in chapter 1 verse 1 creates the impression that Isaiah already had some kind of prophetic ministry during the life of Uzziah. But it was, during the, or it was during the year or that year that King Uzziah died that he had the experience uh, uh, that he describes in Isaiah chapter 6. But that goes back to the 8th century. When you start reading chapter 40, you shift forward the scene completely by 200 years to the exile. Um, and so it creates major uh, problems for those who study the book of Isaiah because you literally have then events described 200 years later in the book of Isaiah. And we'll take a look at that um, in, in just a very brief moment. But I can tell you that many volumes of books have been written just on that particular challenge. Why does Isaiah, the first half, address, uh, why does he address uh, a situation in, this, in the 8th century and then 200 years later from chapter 40 all the way down, all the way to being very specific about Cyrus, the Persian king, my, my servant, and, and so on. And so many scholars as a result of that have seen two volumes of Isaiah. They sometimes call it Isaiah proper and Deutero, second Isaiah. In fact, you may go so far as some people even talking about a trito, a third Isaiah when they really start analyzing and so on. Um, so many, many have concluded that this is the situation. You actually have two different books, but they have been combined into one. The only alternative to that is what we would believe is that we have one book, but that Isaiah had a prophetic insight into what was going to happen 200 years later. And I believe it is safe to say that some parts, perhaps the majority of the book, have been written either by Isaiah or during his time, um, and that the final product may have been put together some date uh, much later. But we, we can't be uh, too emphatic uh, about that. We don't have uh, much by way of conclusive evidence. I've mentioned Hezekiah uh, as being part of the ministry, or that, that Isaiah lived during the time of Hezekiah, Hezekiah. And on this picture you will find uh, Hezekiah's tunnel to the water source outside the city wall. Uh, we have looked at, at Solomon's aqueduct before. This is a, another version of bringing water into the city 
because at that particular time, the city wall, inside the city wall, was not enough water to provide for the city. So people went outside to a fountain to go and collect water. Problem, however, is that the moment you have a siege, you can't leave the city. So how do you get water inside the city? And so Hezekiah, if you look at this picture, it's solid, solid rock. And they have tunneled through the rock underneath to actually get to the fountain. And then they stopped the fountain outside so that the enemy didn't know where the, the water fountain was. But from inside the city, they could go down and under the tunnel and go right to the fountain and, and in that way uh, go and collect water for the city. And so Hezekiah is the one, and he's mentioned in the Bible, and this is proof, literal, literal archaeological proof of that particular tunnel. Someone, I forget all the details about it, but someone actually discovered, some archaeologists discovered this tunnel. And uh, on some of the trips that you do to Israel, you will actually walk through this tunnel and just go and have a look uh, at the, the fountain there. But a study of the background of Isaiah, obviously we need to take into account two completely different sets of, of scenery, as it were, or scenarios. The one is Hezekiah, Assyria, and everything related to that in the 8th century. The second one, the exile, and the coming back from the exile, which is 200 years uh, later. Uh, and, and that's from chapters 40 to 66. I've already referred to chapter 1, verse 1, uh, but Isaiah's main ministry focus was the kingdom of Judah during the early part of the 8th century, uh, chapters 1 to 39, and then it shifts to the exile for chapters 40 to 66. Uh, and this needs to be taken into account. Uh, on this slide, simply just a, a, a summary of the ministry of Isaiah during the times of Uzziah, uh, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, uh, and in this particular uh, version or rendering, it goes slightly into the time of Manasseh uh, as well. Then if we look at the early Isaiah, as it were, and I put it in inverted commas, uh, because I'm not emphatic on that particular issue, I believe in the unity of Isaiah. There have been volumes written just on the unity of Isaiah, or those who want to disprove that, and I'm not going to go into all of those arguments. I don't think it's necessary for us. But Assyria was the rising world power and threatened the peaceful existence of Israel, both Israel and Judah. And, and obviously when they came and they took Samaria, they were just, just a little bit north. And so they, they became a major threat also for Jerusalem. And whereas the kings of the north fell into sin and uh, looked towards Egypt and other places to come and rescue them, uh, and they were not friendly with Judah at the time, by the way, they were almost regarded as enemy. Um, it, it was Isaiah who encouraged Hezekiah during that time not to go to Egypt and other places, but rather to look to the Lord for his salvation. And so um, Nebuchadnezzar, not Nebuchadnezzar, Tichlat Belezer, who invaded Israel in response to a military action by Israel and Damascus, um, that provides us with a backdrop to chapter 7 to, to 12. Uh, but as he wanted to start attacking. In fact, they already sent messengers to Jerusalem to submit, to subject, and to hand themselves over. Hezekiah took that letter to the Lord, showed it to the Lord. Now that is described for us in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah said to him, just take to the Lord, uh, trust the Lord, and the Lord will help you. And some news reached Tichlet Belezer uh, in, in making him turn around and go back home, where he eventually was actually uh, murdered. And so the enemies of Judah fell into the hands of Assyria, that was Damascus, Aram in 731, and then Samaria in 722. But uh, Hezekiah, uh, trusting the Lord, um, he was able to survive. Uh, they were now a small little state, Israel is gone, and they, were, they remained behind, but Hezekiah trusted the Lord, and Isaiah was used as a major influence in the life of Hezekiah. It shows you the importance of the ministry of, his, of, of Isaiah during this particular time. In terms of his message, Isaiah's message is, is very clear. His emphasis was on the Lord. Trust in the Lord, and the Lord will see you through. And uh, this comes through when Ahaz, uh, in the north, relied on outside help, but eventually fell to the Assyrians. But despite the odds against him, Hezekiah trusted the Lord, and the Lord uh, came through for him. And without even fighting a war, Tichlet Belezer had to uh, pick up and go back home uh, without eventually taking, uh, taking Jerusalem. And when you look at those two sections in Isaiah, the first section is pretty much on judgment. And that's the message that Isaiah got in chapter 6. Go to the nation, 
They will not listen to you. They are hard of heart, but you've got to preach to them because um, I have a message for them. So most of the, the, the prophecies you read in the first 39 chapters are about judgment, God's judgment and God's promise of judging Israel. But in chapters 40 to 66, the emphasis is on forgiveness. By now, Jerusalem had fallen, the people had been in exile, and they need encouragement. They need hope for the future. And so the latter part of Isaiah is pretty much focused on hope and the future uh, and God coming through for them and bringing release and relief for them and rest, restoring Israel once again. In terms of contents, you have to really look at chapters 1 to 39 uh, as one section and then 40 to 66 as another. But the first part of the book reflects the time of Hezekiah, as we saw. Chapters 1 to 6 is an introduction. We have some prophecies in the first five chapters. In chapter 6, the calling of Isaiah. But the message in those first five chapters is that Judah failed. There are beautiful pictures there. A picture of God establishing a vineyard. And uh, his, Israel is the vineyard, as it were, or Judah. And, and I cared for my vineyard, but, but they, didn't look, they didn't care for me. And so the walls came down and it's grown full of thistles and thorns and, and that sort of thing. That's part of the message. And so using the image, imagery, uh, God is, is complaining about the fact that Israel or Judah had fallen into sin. Uh, and then chapter 7 to 12 uh, is Ahaz's failure to trust in the Lord. And the focus, therefore, is here in the north. Ahaz is the king of the north, not the king of Judah. And so that provides you a bit of a backdrop. This is against the back backdrop of, of God coming to judge or to punish the north. That is Samaria. So you've got to read those chapters against that sort of background. And then chapters 13 to 23, we have oracles against some of the neighboring nations. God, uh, it always amazes me in these books how God is concerned and has things to say, sometimes harsh things to say about the nations around uh, Israel. But uh, it is normally uh, the Philistines or Edom and Moab and then it's Egypt and, and then it's the, the, um, the Assyria. It, it, they're all included somehow or the other. And paging through the book, you will see the headings even in the NIV. Uh, prophecies against so-and-so, prophecies against this and that and uh, the other nation. Then chapters 24 to 27, God's general judgment on the earth and His deliverance of His people, which is promised. And then chapters 28 to 33, the Assyrian threat. We, we have the so-called woe uh, oracles over here. Th those are warnings against Israel. And, and Hezekiah is encouraged not to go to Egypt because that was, the, that was the temptation. The Assyrians are coming from the north. Let's get some help from the other big nation because Judah is only a tiny little speck. Uh, let's get some help from the Egyptians. And... Um, uh, his, uh, Isaiah said to Hezekiah again and again, don't go to Egypt. Don't trust Egypt. Your help is not in human beings. Your help is with God. And so that is what you need to read when you read, um, or the background that you need to understand when you read chapters 28 to 33. 34 to 37, those chapters um, describe Hezekiah. We actually now have narrative. We have storytelling. Uh, as opposed to prophetic literature, which is great. It fills us in in some of the events that happen, confirmed uh, the story that we have also in Kings. And then chapters 38 and 39, uh, we have a description, which is almost a repeat of what we find in Kings, uh, of Hezekiah's illness, his recovery. He prayed to the Lord. Uh, we have the story of Hezekiah saying, how will I know that the Lord has listened to me? And Isaiah said to him, um, okay, what sign do you want? Do you want the sun to go forward or backwards? And uh, Hezekiah said, let the sun go backwards. And so the sun um, went backwards on the steps. You could see the shadow coming back. Uh, it's an interesting story. And that was confirmation. And Hezekiah did not die. But an interesting hap thing happens over here. During the last 15 years, he had a delegation of people come to have a look at Israel. They came from Babylon. Now, Babylon was already there and already beginning to rise in power to take over from the Assyrians. And so when, when this delegation came to Jerusalem to come and have a look around, um, Hezekiah invited them into the palace and showed them all the wealth and the articles in the, in the temple and in the, in the palace and so on. And Isaiah came and said to Hezekiah, Who are these people? And, and he told them who they are. And then uh, Isaiah said to him, Those very same people will be your downfall. Not in your generation, 
but in the generations to come. And so ver- chapter 39 actually prepares the way for chapter 40. When, because chapter 40 then assumes the fall of Jerusalem under the Babylonians, those very same people who came and looked at the wealth of Jerusalem, uh, probably to come and check it out if you, if you uh, wish. Uh, but it, it, it didn't happen in Hezekiah's time, and he was actually grateful. He said, at least it won't happen in my time. It would happen in my son's time or my uh, followers. When we go to uh, the contents of chapters 40 to 66, as I said, you fast forward the story now by roughly 200 years, and uh, in chapters 40 to 55, Judah is in exile, but God is in control. The people must learn to trust in God and His judgment. And then there is promised delivery. Now remember the background now is exile. The people are away from Jerusalem. They're in exile. And uh, you need to read those chapters against that background. And God is promising some relief and restoration later on. Chapters 56 to 66, the returned exiles are restored uh, in the land. And these chapters include the prophecies uh, that we know so well. Chapter 53, for example, uh, is a beautiful depiction of of a description of Jesus and dying on the cross for, for the sins and he's, he's reckoned with the transgressors and so on. Um, it, it really is, it's almost word for word what Jesus went through. And so um, we would look at those chapters definitely as prophetically looking into the, into the future uh, and looking at Jesus. Some of the themes, um, we have an interesting um, occurrence here where Isaiah had children. And his sons uh, received names. And in chapter 7, verse 3, Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. Ephraim here refers to Israel. You remember when we talked about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So there's the northern kingdom and their enemies. And so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son Shear Yashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct uh, of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field, and say to him, Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. So this Ahaz uh, is the king of the south and not of the north. I think I said previously it was of the north. But when you look down um, at the bottom, uh, there's a footnote, and Shear Yashub means a remnant will return. And so that was a promise for the future. We have a similar kind of thing happening. So the son of Isaiah had a prophetic name, if you wish. And so we have a similar thing happening in, in 18, uh, chapter 8, verse 18. Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. Interesting phenomenon. Another thing is the servant motif that we find in Isaiah. Uh, in those latter chapters that I referred to earlier on, we have the servant of the Lord occurring. Many of those are songs or poems or prophecies about Jesus and how He came and what He has done. Uh, and we call them the servant uh, songs or the, uh, the servant motif passages. And then God is identified as the Holy One of Israel with the emphasis on God's high expectations of His people. Isaiah's emphasis on a redeemer, um, that redeemer ultimately for us is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the nation, um, and that, that, beca- that came into fulfillment. And then Isaiah's eschatology, the word eschatology means the end time events. The word eschatos means end. And so eschatology is the study of the end times. And Isaiah focuses on the kingdom of God, and that is God's rule on this world, in this earth. Uh, and also his future rule. Uh, and so bringing, back, bringing people back to the, to the concept that God is our king and we need to serve God. Uh, and no study of eschatology is complete unless you understand something of the kingdom of God uh, in the concept, uh, as a concept in the Bible. Some of the passages that I want to uh, highlight, uh, I've already referred to chapter 6, the calling of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, uh, we have a reference, what we believe was a fulfillment. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And we believe that was fulfilled in Jesus. How it was fulfilled in this first instance uh, 
uh, is difficult for us to know. What Isaiah meant, was he referring to an event and maybe a young girl who didn't necessarily miraculously became pregnant, but there may have been an initial fulfillment, but certainly from a New Testament perspective, we, will, we believe that this verse, this particular reference was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. In fact, the New Testament quotes this as a fulfillment uh, with the birth of Jesus. And then chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, um, we have a description with some names of Jesus. Um, For us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and so on. Chapter 40, be still and wait. Uh, If you wait like an eagle, uh, you will have the strength like an eagle. That's the passage in chapter 40. Chapter 53, the suffering servant, we've, re- we've re- referred to that. Chapter 55, I've heard preach at evangelistic meetings again and again, and it starts with a wonderful invitation, and it simply says, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. It's all about the grace of God and how we will receive the grace of God. Buy without money. It's a contradiction in term. You don't buy without money. You receive without money. And so it's a a wonderful description of of the gospel message, in fact. And then uh, I've already referred to chapter 58. Uh, True fast. Uh, uh, it It is a reference to the problem in Israel all along. And that is making religion into something that is a legalistic requirement. And as long as I tick off the list at the end of every day, uh, I prayed, I read, uh, I attended, I gave some money, I'm okay. Uh, and, and going through the rituals and God, through the prophets, again and again and again, you read them and you, you get this message overwhelmingly. And that is, again and again, come back to me. I, I need your heart. I want your, your love. I don't need the things you do as much as I need your heart. And if your heart is in the right place, the things you do are fine, but the things you do don't please me. Uh, In Malachi, we'll see that in a couple of weeks' time. But in Malachi, God goes so far as to say, your your sacrifices stink. There is stench in my nose. I don't don't like them uh, because you just go through the rituals, but I need your heart. And it's a message that even as Christians, we need to hear again and again. Uh, I, I can be very, very legalistic in my own life. Uh, I, I get up and I have my quiet time. As long as I've had my quiet time, I'm okay. It's not about having a quiet time. It's about a relationship with God, which a quiet time or reading the Bible or praying uh, help me to do, help me in a relationship. But it's not about the, the legalistic requirements. It's about relating to God uh, as a child of God. It takes us to Jeremiah, um, guiding Judah through a disaster. And now, as you will see, and we're only simply following the sequence in the Bible, uh, but there is another way of studying the prophets, and that is actually to do them historically or on a timeline, to do them one by one as they occur uh, in time. But we are not doing that. So suddenly, uh, with, uh, after looking at Isaiah, who lived in the 8th century, we fast forward the story to the fall of Jerusalem, which happened in 586, if you remember correctly. Now, Jeremiah was called around the year 627, and he lived through the fall of Jerusalem to the year roughly 580 or so. We don't know exactly uh, when he died. But Jeremiah was used by God to help guide the nation through a disaster. It was a massive disaster. We'll see that in the next book we're going to look at, the book of Lamentations. But I don't think we can really honestly put ourselves in the shoes of those Jews, of those Israelites, when, when the Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple came down and, it, and the temple was ravaged and all the stuff was taken away um, by, the, by the enemy, by the Babylonians at the time. That provides us a bit of the backdrop. So if you go to the book of Jeremiah um, and you read the first couple of verses, it says, The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, 
down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. Now, you can't have it more specific than that. So, Jeremiah provides us with wonderful background uh, and the setting for his own prophecies. In terms of the prophet Jeremiah himself, that's as much as we know about him. Uh, more than that, we don't have a whole lot about. Um, but he had a long and often tragic ministry. Oftentimes, people called him the weeping prophet. And it's for that reason that Lamentations has been added at the end of the book of Jeremiah. And we'll look at Lamentations in a moment. But uh, people believed wrongly that Jeremiah was the author, or probably wrongly that Jeremiah was the author of the book of Lamentations. It could have been but it's not, he is not necessarily the prophet. But he is called the weeping prophet because he lived through the fall of Jerusalem and he had a very, very sad message that he had to proclaim to the nation of Israel, uh, of Judah, actually the southern kingdom. And Remember by now, the northern kingdom is no more. They, they went out of uh, the, out of the uh, equation uh, 200 years before, roughly, or 150 years before. Uh, Jeremiah delivered a very, very, unpopular message. And here is a scenario, and I'm not going to go through every single slide that I have in your notes, but here's the scene. Jeremiah is like any of the other prophets. He has a ministry. He comes and he goes, you know, speaks to the king, and so on. But um, the, the Babylonians are on the scene. Um, and in 612, if you go back to the date in 627, already Jeremiah started his ministry. During the reign of Josiah, Josiah was the child king. He became a king when he was only a child. He served the Lord for a long period of time. It was a revival. Jeremiah starts ministering during that same time. Maybe part of the ongoing revival is, is maybe even because of the ministry of Jeremiah. But towards the end uh, of, of um, the um, Assyrian Empire, the Babylonians are pushing further north. In 612, they take Nineveh and they destroy Nineveh. And then they're pushing across and they, they're aiming towards Egypt. And so in that process, they're coming down. And, and they know it. I mean, they didn't have telephones and television in those days, but they, the news spread. And so the Babylonians are there and they're coming. And so Jeremiah, as I said, many of the prophets interpreted the circumstances for their, their people. And as Jeremiah listened to the Lord and he received his call in chapter 1, you need to read the rest of chapter 1, to, talk, to, to find out about his call. He believed that he was too young, actually, uh, to be called to, be, uh, to become a prophet. But the Lord had this message for his nation. And as the Babylonians came, and eventually they besieged Jerusalem, and that happened over several uh, times. By now, uh, it is the, maybe the last time, the third time, that the Babylonians are actually on the way, and they besieged Jerusalem. And Jeremiah's message is essentially... Hand yourselves over to the Babylonians. Open the gates and you will live. But there are other prophets more than, than Jeremiah. Several other prophets. And they say, nope, that's not the way it works. God has told us that he's going to protect Jerusalem. And Jeremiah said, it's not true. Jerusalem will fall unless you listen to me. If you listen to me, you open the gate and invite the king in and bow before him and pay your taxes and all the rest of it. Then the Lord will spare you. And so it didn't happen. And uh, as a result of that, uh, not only uh, the king and the normal people, but even the prophets were totally against Jeremiah to the point where he was taken into prison, uh, put down into a, an empty uh, um, a, a fountain or a pit or a something where a hole where he had to live. And uh, he, he almost died as a result of that. But somehow the message of Jeremiah also reached the ears of the Babylonians on the outside of the wall. So ultimately when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed everything and they gave Jeremiah the option of coming to Babylon. They, to Babylon. they left him alive. He was a priest and, and they knew about him. And so they gave him the option of going to Babylon or to stay in Jerusalem. He opted to stay in Jerusalem. Again, there were a few little uprisings and rebellions, and so on. And again, Jeremiah said, you must listen to the Lord, just pay your taxes and submit to Babylon. Again, the people didn't listen to, to Jeremiah. And they, they had a rebellion against, uh, uh, against Babylon, 
and they paid some money towards, I think, Egyptians or someone else to come and help them, and the Babylonians came back again. Um, or they were afraid that the Babylonians may come back again, and they then fled to Egypt. They even asked Jeremiah about that, and he said, don't go to Egypt, but they didn't listen to him. Uh, they even took Jeremiah with them, and it was in Egypt somewhere where he continued his ministry and probably eventually died uh, as a result uh, maybe of age or whatever the case might be. So that's essentially the message that you find uh, in Jeremiah. It's interesting when you look at the writing of the book of Jeremiah that we actually have evidence uh, and references to writing. Uh, and it is in this case that we read in chapter 36 that uh, in this particular regard that we read about Baruch, who was a scribe, and he wrote up some of the prophecies of Jeremiah. Those things were sent to the king. The king was so furious about the negative message, he regarded a negative message of Jeremiah that he burned it. So God said to Jeremiah, let Baruch write it up again. Now this time you protect it and you hide it. So some of that was handed down to us. Interesting little thing, archaeologically speaking, not long ago, uh, maybe 10, 15, uh, maybe 20 years ago or whenever, um, a seal uh, was discovered in Jerusalem with the name of Baruch on it, a scribe, the name Baruch on it. Uh, just confirming probably that seal dates back. I mean, how many Baruchs, scribe Baruchs can you have in the city of Jerusalem where Jeremiah lived? And so many scholars believe that that is actually evidence of this exact same person uh, who lived with uh, Jeremiah in Jerusalem. The book refers to Jeremiah in both the first and in the third person. So some of this is written by Jeremiah or written on his behalf by, let's say, Baruch and others may have been written about him sometime later on. Uh, when it was all finished, we, we don't know when it was finished, but obviously sometime in the mid or maybe even the late uh, 6th century. I have given you most of the background information to uh, Jeremiah, trying to steer the kingdom of Judah through a crisis when the Babylonians came uh, into the country. Josiah was the last of the kings uh, in terms of a little bit of a revival, uh, recovering, um, uh, restoring the temple um, and serving the Lord, but postponing the judgment of God to some extent. But after Josiah, it was downhill fast. Uh, and Jeremiah had to live through all of that. And people simply didn't want to listen to uh, the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah's ministry... He advised the king to hand himself over. Because of this message, Jeremiah faced many challenges while ministering during the final days of Jerusalem. He was opposed and nearly killed. Nearly uh, um, he starved uh, because of hunger at one stage. But he survived and the Lord kept him um, alive. At the fall of Jerusalem, after that, as I said to you, he was uh, given the option to stay or to go. And eventually, with the, the people fleeing, he ended up in Egypt where he ultimately died. Some of the message of Jeremiah, the book is about the Lord's concern for his people during times of political and spiritual crisis. Um, in chapter 1, verse 10, in fact, maybe a few verses from, my, from Jeremiah chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to me in verse 4, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, oh, Sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out His hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms, to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And then it goes on to a vision. And so that is the, the core of Jeremiah's ministry, to break down, to tear down, to bring the judgment of God, but then at the end it's to build up once again. And so the book, as we will see in a moment, ends on a positive note, uh, helping the people to see that there is hope somewhere uh, in the future. Jeremiah's oracles, um, I told you some prophets, prophecies we call oracles as well. Uh, he, it includes indictment oracles, especially in chapters 5 to 9. Judgment oracles, 
instruction about how to live um, in the ways of God. And then we also have the aftermath, uh, which we find uh, the, the promises of God uh, towards the end, as I, as I said just a moment ago. I'm sure most of you know this verse, uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. This is what the Lord says in verse um, 10. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, and this is the verse, or this is the section that Daniel knew about when he read in the book of, of, of uh, Jeremiah. I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Let me just uh, make a few little comments about context. Uh, you have probably been either SMS this verse or you have a promise box and you pull it out and you believe the Lord has promised you all these wonderful things. There's a context though. And the context is very, very important. Most people don't go and read the first few verses before verse 11. It is a wonderful promise. And God does have wonderful uh, promises for His people. But listen to the context. This is the text, verse 1, of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now that should sound fairly familiar to you. Now you now have the historical background and backdrop to be able to understand where Jeremiah is writing from and what is the background. People are in exile miles away in Babylon. He still lives in Jerusalem. And it may be somewhere between the fall of Jerusalem uh, and some of the first times that Jerusalem was taken by the Babylonians. This was after, and in fact he gives us that information, this was after King Jehoiakim and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem, probably in 597, or maybe even before. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, or Elasa, son of Shaphan, and to Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. The letter said this, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number, do not decrease. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Now that sounds like blasphemy to the normal Jew. These people are in Babylon. They are in exile. They don't want to be there. Jeremiah is writing them and saying, Settle, marry, have children, give your children to marriage. In other words, you are going to be there for a long while. You might as well settle. Because you're not talking about getting wives for your children if you don't have children yet. So you're going to be there for a while. And then he says, and this is important, um, do not listen in verse, verse 8, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. And these other prophets are saying, this is only for a week or two or a month or two. Uh, the, don't do anything. The Lord is going to take us back to Jerusalem. And Jeremiah is writing them, again, a very unpopular message. And he's saying to the Jews, settle in Babylon. In fact, bless the city of Babylon. Now that really sounds like blasphemy. Because how can you do that? I, I believe there's an, a wonderful message. I can preach about this, but I won't do that tonight. But um, uh, there's a wonderful message for us. Uh, living, let's say, here in Johannesburg uh, about what God wants us to do for our city because God is saying to them, if the city prospers, you will prosper. And, and it's in that context that he says, I know the plans I have for you. But remember, it is not a plan for immediate blessing. It is not a plan for immediate release. Jeremiah mentions 70 years in that passage. And we often forget that. We just pull out this little verse and we say, oh, the Lord's going to bless you and so on. And of course God wants to bless us somehow or the other. 
but we sometimes give false hope to people with a, a promise of immediate release or immediate blessing. And in this particular context of that verse, we're talking 70 years of settling in a foreign land and blessing another city rather than blessing uh, Jerusalem with our presence. In terms of an outline for the book of Jeremiah, chapters 1 to 20, prophecies and prayers of Jeremiah, making for some very beautiful reading. Chapters 21 to 29, warnings regarding the fall of Jerusalem. It's still in the future, but Jeremiah's warning is saying, if you turn back to the Lord, and by the way, I need to, I need to remind you that this is the message of the Bible. God will pronounce judgment. But there's always a way out, and that is repentance. And you see that again and again and again, if you repent. The book of Jonah is a wonderful example of that. In 40 days, says Jonah, this place is done. And the people repent, and what does God do? He withholds his judgment, because that's in the nature of God. That's the grace of God. And so there was always an opportunity for the people to repent, but they didn't. And therefore, the judgment of God eventually came upon them. Promises of hope and restoration, that's part of what I just also read, chapters 30 to 33, uh, although this one is particularly in, in chapter 29. Chapters 30, 34 to 45, the final days of Jerusalem. Now we're back into narrative once again. It describes the situation around Jeremiah and Jerusalem and the besieging of the city by the Babylonians. And then... As you will find in many of the books, the prophetic books, there is judgment on the other nations, um, on the foreign nations. And they mention name by name uh, with different sections about how that will happen. And then the fall of Jerusalem is described in chapter 52. And in a certain sense, the book is very sad because that's where it ends. The book ends with a description of the fall of Jerusalem and um, not the restoration. Some of the major themes, God reigns over the nations. And, and therefore is the potter. It's a picture that we find in Jeremiah. God is the potter, and we are the clay, chapter 18. And then the new covenant in chapter 31. Uh, there's always that future promise that somewhere there's going to be a new covenant. Somewhere in the future, God will take the heart of stone. As I said, that's an Ezekiel picture, but the concept we find in most uh, of the prophets. And then the false prophets. Um, in Jeremiah especially, we encounter the false prophets. Uh, there are several others as well. Amos is another one who encountered some, some opposition from other prophets. Now, that gives you the impression that there were all of these prophets running around uh, Judah and Israel at the time, and many of them didn't hear from God. They were simply doing a job, uh, and they were actually saying what the kings wanted to hear, uh, or whoever the nation, the, the nation was. And sometimes they are paid. Uh, like, like we may do some payment for future telling or uh, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, Jeremiah's message was one of truth, and eventually he was proved right when he said, Jerusalem is going to fall unless you repent and unless you open the gates, uh, the, the city will be destroyed. They never saw that coming, uh, the other prophets, uh, but we actually learn a lot about the false prophets in the book of Jeremiah. And there are some passages that you can read later on. Now that leads us straight into the book of Lamentations. And in fact, the book of um, Jeremiah provides us that backdrop to, uh, Jeremiah, uh, to, to the book of, of Lamentations. The Hebrew title of the book comes from the opening word, Ekah. And it literally means how or, or alas. It's, a, it's almost an expression of, of despair. Um, it's almost like we would say, oh Lord, or uh, oh, my word, or something like that. So this, this is the way the book is, is introduced. It's, a, it's an expression of grief or groaning. And the title Lamentations is derived from the Latin Vulgate, and that's how we got the book uh, or the name for our book. Uh, it is part of the Kituvim. We saw that last week, and so I'm not going to uh, go through all of that, but it's read on the ninth day of Av, uh, which is um, commemorating the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, in 586 but also in uh, BC, but also in 70 uh, AD. The position of Lamentations in our Bible is based on uh, the Septuagint. In terms of the authorship, um, we really need to just briefly go and have a look at Second Chronicles chapter 35 over here. We have the description of the death of Josiah. Josiah was that revival king, the child king who 
really served the Lord, sought the Lord, restored the temple and everything else. And eventually Josiah died. He was buried in the tombs of his father in verse, 40, uh, in verse 24. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for him. Jeremiah composed laments for Josiah. And to this day, all the men and women singers commemorate Josiah in the laments. These became a tradition in Israel and are written in the laments. Now, if you read that verse very carefully, people said Jeremiah is responsible for lamentations, but this verse does not indicate the book of lamentations, but rather the, the death of Josiah the king. And so he wrote some lamentations about Josiah. That does not mean that Jer Jeremiah wrote the book of lamentations, which really weeps uh, or laments the fall of Jerusalem, the city, and uh, that of Judah. And so ultimately, we just have to say we don't know. Jeremiah may have written this book, but we actually, at the end of the day, we don't know. There is no doubt that the fall of Jerusalem provides us with the backdrop to the book of Lamentations. It's a book of songs of lament, and the city of Jerusalem is clearly in the picture. Uh, in fact, we, you, can, you can almost just open it up and, and start reading it. And it's a, it's a very, very sad story. And as I say, this is how it starts. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are upon her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is none to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. You see, there's it very, very specific. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed feasts. And so the list goes on and on. In terms of the structure of the book of, of Lamentations, it consists of five poems, and every poem uh, is a chapter uh, in our book. So we have five chapters uh, in this book. The first one is the grief over Jerusalem's destruction. The second one is the day of God's anger and a lament for the daughter of Zion, which is Jerusalem. And then a prayer for God's compassion and the author's own grief and hope. And then there's the horror and the siege and the fall of Jerusalem, uh, very vividly described in chapter 4. And in chapter 5, there's the disgrace of Zion. And then a plea for Zion or for Jerusalem's restoration. In terms of the message, Lamentations gives us an insight into the emotions of the nation. Uh, in Jeremiah, we find the prophecies, judgment. And so on. But here you have a, a nation in, in, uh, in mourning. they mourning the fall of their own um, city. And, and as I said before, I don't think we can even begin to imagine what has gone into, into the psyche, what's gone on in the psyche of the nation. When they saw their city, their capital city, go back to the Psalms, some of those Psalms of ascent. Oh, Jerusalem, how beautiful you are. We can't wait to get into you. Uh, there is the temple. Uh, one day in the temple is better than a thousand elsewhere. All of those, gone, destroyed. Um, the temple being uh, made unclean by the enemy trampling on it. And it, I think emotionally, the nation just struggled to get over this. In fact, they, they almost never got over it. And this was the reality of the unthinkable. God has turned his back on his own house, on his own nation, and on his own uh, city. And the author or the composer here saw this as the day of the Lord. We'll come back to that concept later on uh, in the prophets. But that's a theme that we'll pick up again and again. And as much as this book bemoans the fact that God has left the nation... It also turns to God in chapter 3, verse 21. In this sense, it is so much like the book of Job that we looked at last week. Um, and it says this, uh, verse 19, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions 
never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for Him. And that's major faith. That's true faith. In the face of a totally destroyed Jerusalem, a devastated nation, my faith is still in God. And that's the same message that we find in the book of Job. Some of the themes, the theme of suffering, we find re repeated over here. The book deals with the fact that God has abandoned the nation, or Zion has turned his back uh, on, his, on his covenant people and the implications of that. It also acknowledges that the sins of the people have caused this rift. It's not God, it is the sins of the nation. And the poet puts his hope in God, he talks to God about that. I'm giving you some passages to read in the book of Lamentations. It's not, it's not quiet time reading when you sit in your bed at night. Unless you feel very sad, it will help you to express your sadness and your, your broken emotions. And that's what the book of Lamentations will, will do for you. But those are some of the passages that I'm, I'm suggesting that you read. We'll do the book of Ezekiel next week, uh, next time. So I'm not going to deal with Ezekiel right now. I'll come back to that and then deal with Ezekiel and Daniel uh, in one shot. And so that's uh, all for this evening. May the Lord bless you and, and uh, look ahead at some of the passages that you need to read and prepare uh, for next week. And thanks for coming. The Lord bless you.